So you've probably seen images like this in the past, images of space junk and the horrifying number of dangerous objects that exist in low Earth orbits having been put there by our own short-sighted species. However, what's not mentioned most of the time is the fact that this is not to scale. If you were to look at our planet, you could not see these pieces of space junk. They would be too too small to be visible to the naked eye. However, this doesn't make them any less dangerous. I'm embarrassed to admit that in the past, I was of the school of thought that Starlink and OneWeb did not represent any kind of threat to space junk or man's ability to access space and to our network of satellites upon which our economy depends. And man, was I dead wrong. Even though Starlink does not represent a threat in itself, there's a lot of things that have been built into it in order to avoid mid-space mid collisions. And OneWeb is very much the same. That doesn't mean that these collisions cannot occur. And if they do, it would turn a Starlink satellite from a very useful provider of high-speed internet across the globe into a dangerous, unguided missile. And you may think that the favorite famous movie that starred Sandra Bullock and George Clooney was fanciful and the scenario that it depicted was completely unlikely. But if you think that, you'd be wrong. It's very plausible. And if it did happen when Sandra returned safely to Earth, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, she would be returning to an Earth that would not be able to return to space for many decades, and an Earth that would be an economic freefall. So the question is, is it really worth it? Is it worth it for SpaceX to be putting up so many satellites just to provide high-speed internet access to every square meter of the planet? Is it worth it to have so many competitors who are doing precisely the same thing with thousands of new satellites in low Earth orbits providing thousands of more chances of catastrophe? Well, the answer to that is no, unless we can come up with a solution to clean up the space junk, which represents more than 80% of all of the debris in orbit. That's right, only about 20% of what's up there is actually useful. The rest of it is dead garbage. What are we doing to get rid of it? And are we doing enough? Well, we're gonna find that out in just a minute. Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, still a little bit tired, but very much on the mend. I'm going to be uh, live streaming a launch later on, so need to kind of save my energy for that, assuming it doesn't get scrubbed again, let's certainly hope. But in the meantime, I want to talk about an extremely pressing issue that is associated with what I've been talking about during these live streams. And that is, of course, in relation to the danger represented by space junk or space debris. Excuse me. So, 
What we have and what a lot of people know about is thousands of pieces of space junk that's left over from destroyed or dead satellites, flecks of paint, uh, unused boosters that are flying around in low Earth orbit, thousands upon thousands of objects, which I'm sure all of you have seen the little animation that I showed you in the intro and that sort of thing. But there are lots of people that talk about how this is overblown and it doesn't need to be anything that puts the brakes on Starlink and that sort of thing. And I agree in principle. Starlink does not represent an increased threat to space junk or any cataclysm associated with that on its own. Starlink, they're equipped with ion engines to push them out of the way of any space junk that might be on a collision course, and they're also designed to re-enter the atmosphere at the end of life. So they've been pretty well designed, at least in terms of responsibility in space environment, is concerned. However, one thing that they do not have is the ability to detect very small pieces of space debris, say three, four millimeters in size, that would impact them at speeds of many thousands of kilometers per hour, many times faster than the speed of a rifle bullet, and would take out the sensitive electronics on the satellite. There would be no way to detect these things, and therefore no way for the Starlink satellite to avoid the collision. And it would be sufficient to take the Starlink satellite out of operation and make it into a hazard. Its trajectory would change, and it could possibly collide with some other dead satellite in orbit. The vast majority of satellites that are in orbit are dead right now and have no direction whatsoever and are very vulnerable to crashing into each other. So the more satellites that we put up, the greater the chance increases that one of these small pieces of debris are going to incapacitate one of these satellites and turn it into a threat, resulting in what is called the Kessler syndrome or the Kessler effect. It's called a variety of different things where one large piece of not space debris, but a space object, a large satellite, or perhaps the ISS, or the Crew Dragon, or who knows what, comes into collision with a large enough piece of space debris in order to destroy it. This would, in turn, not only result in the loss of life, but would also allow for huge amounts of space debris from such a large object to be ejected into low Earth orbit, uh, creating more satellites that would be destroyed, which would in turn create more debris, which would destroy more satellites, very much like the chain reaction that causes nuclear fission. And this is not a theory, guys. This is a statistical inevitability. I'll say that again. A statistical inevitability inevitability, not a probability, an inevitability. You crunch the numbers and one day, it could be tomorrow, it could be a hundred years from now, if we do nothing about this problem, eventually the Kessler syndrome will take effect and that would re result in the destruction of everything in low Earth orbit. The astronauts on the ISS might be able to escape in their Soyuz, but it doesn't matter because the amount of space debris that would exist in low Earth orbit at that point would create so much interference and so much danger that it would be impossible to launch anything in the future for many decades to come. The effect would be cataclysmic on the world economy. It would undoubtedly plunge us into a worldwide depression. And so the question is, why the hell are we not doing more about this? Europe appears to have taken the lead, as you're going to see here in the upcoming video. They have a number of plans, but still, when you're talking about something this serious, that could 
cripple the economy of this planet. Now, geosynchronous satellites, things that are tens of thousands of kilometers up in orbit, they would probably be safe from some kind of effect. So the military satellites up there or geosynchronous communication satellites, they might be able to fill in the gaps a little bit. But still, all of these satellites, which are economies and we as human beings rely on every single day would be taken out. And the amount of effort and money it would take to reproduce their effect on the surface of the Earth would be unreal. It would be so colossal, it would utterly bankrupt every major economy on the planet. It would take so many decades for us to recover. I am not exaggerating, guys, and I am going to show you why all of this is the case in just a minute. As I suggested earlier, the Europeans are taking the lead on space junk cleanup with a vehicle called the ELSA-D, which essentially uses an electromagnetic plate to grab onto a satellite and carry it back to the ELSA-D for capture. Once this capture is achieved by carefully maneuvering the magnet into place, and the initial stage, by the way, is just a test to demonstrate that the magnet can go out into space and then return safely to the satellite. It's disappointing to me that we're only in test phases after all of these damn years, but nonetheless, we're at least making progress. In 2025, Astroscale is going to be capturing dead satellites and other space junk and getting rid of the damn things. And incidentally, the LCD is still capable of capturing tumbling objects as well, because in space, things that tumble remain at their rate of tumbling very consistently, unless an outside force has influence on them, which is why I find a muamua to be such an unusual phenomenon. Its rate of tumbling did not change, in spite of its speed change. If it was outgassing from a comet, or methane, for example, as so many people insist, the tumbling rate should have changed, and yet it did not, suggesting artificial intelligence behind it. But enough of that. So, the satellite captures the tumbling object and sends it along its way. A very ingenious solution, and we're only starting. What happens if the satellite has to find a missing piece of space junk? Well, the ship executes a systematic search, section by section, watching every square millimeter with its own sensors, which are far more useful at this distance in low Earth orbit. And of course, it knows what area to search in because the offending space junk is probably located in low Earth orbit in the same location of the satellite that created it. So eventually, it tracks it down, it hooks it in, and then sends it on its way to Earth to be burnt up in the atmosphere. And this is what leads to some problems. Because if something from the dead satellite, God forbid, falls on somebody's head during re-entry, then the person who has liability or the company that has liability is the company that had the dead sat in the first place. And this, of course, is a strong disincentive for anybody who owns dead satellites to let anybody else touch them. But still, new legislation needs to be executed now that removes all responsibility from anybody as far as clearing up space junk is concerned because the problem is entirely too serious. And this is my favorite space junk removal system, the CLAW. Unlike its mostly Japanese counterpart, this device is designed to just simply grab hold of any large object 
take control and chuck it into the atmosphere. It's just the best way to get rid of space trash. Hurling it up into upper orbit just endangers other satellites. You've got to send it down into the atmosphere. And the ideal solution is to have satellites do that themselves. And for those skeptics out there, these maps that we get to see all the time only consist of objects that are 10 centimeters in diameter or larger. There are millions of other objects that are smaller than 10 millimeters, which at the speed of tens of thousands of kilometers per hour would still wreak incredible damage on a variety of satellites, including the ISS. As a matter of fact, the ISS gets pelted all the time. Now this isn't the ISS, it's a space shuttle, but it had a five millimeter object impact with it at incredibly high speed. And as you can see, it blew right through the hull and it actually came out 10 millimeters in size. Imagine what would have happened if this had hit a far more delicate satellite. The damage would have been catastrophic and most probably would have killed the satellite. And given that satellites don't have human crews to replace such impacts, it would have been impossible to fix it. And thus, such a satellite would become a hazard. And those hazards are going to increase the larger number of satellites we put into orbit, which means cleaning up space junk has become a real priority. And in case you need one more big piece of evidence, here is the impact of a three millimeter ball on a very thick sheet of aluminum. As you can see, the damage is extensive, enough to knock the satellite off its course and require a tremendous amount of corrective thrust in order to get the satellite back on target, assuming it has an enough fuel left to do so. The fact of the matter is, the problem is very, very real. And there are a number of companies that have been contracted to try to do something about this, but not nearly enough money is being spent on it. And the rate of progress, to be frank, is kind of slow. Nevertheless, there's a lot of stuff in the works, especially on the European and Japanese side. This particular solution, as you can see from this young lady holding this net, is a net type of solution that will capture not only small sats, but also smaller pieces of space junk, depending on the weave of the net. It's a very ingenious concept, and one that would allow the capture of large numbers of space debris and hurl it back into the atmosphere. Obviously, there are strong pieces of titanium and other heat resistant elements in any piece of space junk that could potentially represent a threat to people on the surface of the planet. Nevertheless, it's a risk worth taking given the potential consequences, let me tell you. And coming up in a little bit, we have another solution, which I have to admit is kind of a tie for my favorite solution to space junk. And this is a solution from Skyrora coming up in just a moment. In the meantime, we talk about the Kessler effect, what it could do, destroy SpaceX at the very least, but this Skyrora situation has multiple fuel tanks on its top stage, not a kicker stage like on the Electron, but capable of carrying out 15 or so relights so that it can push space junk back into the atmosphere multiple times after it's already made a profit deploying small sats into orbit. So it can essentially for free get rid of space junk after it's made a profit on its primary mission. My suspicion is that they're not going to charge free and they're simply going to make a larger profit out of the deal. Make a profit while cleaning the environment. I like it.
And then, of course, we have another solution from Guess Who, the ESA. And as you can see from the net that this lady is holding, it is a net-related scenario whereby the spacecraft deploys a large net which can capture a satellite or multiple pieces of space junk depending on the weave of the net, grab hold of it, and hurl it down into the atmosphere. A very innovative solution that can be used over and over again again and could handle this problem on a very rapid basis. I mean rapid by geologic terms anyway in a few years, maybe a few decades, but still it's a start and we got to start somewhere. And whereas it used to cost billions of dollars to do this sort of thing, because of new technology, it's a lot more affordable. We just need to invest the innovation, the scientific effort and most of all, the money in saving the planet. Because if we don't, if we stubbornly continue to go about business as usual and the Kessler syndrome becomes a reality, as it certainly will eventually, it will destroy all of Starlink, all of one web. As a matter of fact, our entire low Earth orbit satellite system and also prevent any rocket companies from launching into orbit because there's too much space junk. It would destroy SpaceX, ULA, Roscosmos, our ambitions of returning to the moon, our dreams of going to Mars, all of that would be flushed down the toilet. Is that the future you really want? Me neither. Which means we need to wake up and do something about this fast. So, you scared yet? Well, I hope not. Um, just to be perfectly clear, the odds of something like this happening tomorrow or next week or this year are remote. I mean, you know, it's their space is incredibly big and the odds of something like this occurring are small, but they increase every single year and with every new satellite we launch and launching 60 Starlinks at a time and launching 32 one webs on at a time plus of course the Kuiper belt <laughs> constellation that Jeff Bezos is of course behind on because he's behind on everything um, I, I just don't even think he should send the thing up I think that the competition between Star link and one web will be more than sufficient to cause global internet coverage for everybody on the planet there's no reason to have this much competition and every new satellite that we send up represents a new threat it increases the chances that a small piece of space debris that we can't detect will collide with it creating a large hazard as i said many times during the video. It just isn't worth the risk. It isn't. Unless we clean up all of the small and uncontrolled space debris in orbit. And that is a tall order. The Europeans and the British especially seem to be really embracing this. And I applaud them. But not nearly enough money is being spent. This should be a project that's embraced by the United Nations. Every country on the planet should be doing something about this. Because even if a country has no space program, at all, they should still be very concerned because they rely on satellites in order for their economy to function. Even the smallest countries require that. And it would be a desperate situation indeed for a struggling company to suddenly find their economy in free fall, which is exactly what would happen if the Kessler syndrome were to take effect. And as I've said many times, it's not a question of if, or it's not a question of probability, it's a question of statistical certainty. And something absolutely needs to be done about it, and something 
something needs to be done about it now. And a lot more money than Europe is currently investing in it and the Japanese as well. It's just not enough, not even remotely enough. This needs to be attacked swiftly. And there's a lot of really good solutions out there. They just need to be aggressively supported. And it's worth the billions that it would take to do it because the consequences of the Kessler effect, the Kessler syndrome would be incalculable. Trillions of dollars would be lost, not billions. It would be utterly disastrous. We should do everything we can to stop it. But of course, being human beings, we never look ahead because we're such idiots. Um, it's been observed actually by Dr. Loeb that if a species had mastered space travel millions of years ago, would they even regard us as a sentient species or as a bunch of chimpanzees with nukes? I tend to think the latter. We just don't have any wisdom to match our knowledge yet. We've still got some evolving to do if we are going to survive. And I, of course, hope that we do. It's another reason that we need to become a multi-planetary civilization. One of the reasons I'm wearing this shirt. If we go to Mars and something like the Kessler syndrome occurs, Martians could come from the outside and help clean up the space junk without any risk to themselves and save Earth. That's right. That would be another use for a Martian colony, a self-sustaining Martian colony, something that everybody should be paying note to, something that Elon himself should talk about, aside from the fact that it's in his interest financially to keep launching these Starlinks. And I'm all in favor of Starlink and everything that it represents. And it has been responsibly done, but it still represents a threat. It can't help but represent a threat because of all the other guards garbage that's up there that we can't detect. If you like the way I talk about things, if you enjoy my content and regard it as being accurate as, as opposed to alarmist, you know how to support me. It's all in the description. I could really use it. I'm uh, hoping to go to California to cover Virgin Orbit's next launch, the Tubular Bells launch. I think that that's going to be an amazing experience to bring to you live and very few channels do that. So until we have a complete cleanup of low Earth orbit and make space safe for the human species to expand into the solar system as we should, we should have done this a long time ago. It's long past time and we need to take action. Our leaders need to take action and you need to contract, contact your congressman, your senator, your MP, whoever is in charge in your country and do something about it. But until that's done, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.